welcome to Manita Sister Corner's seventh video. Today we will talk about Anne Askew. Anne Askew's life was one of the many made famous by John Fox in his book about martyrs in 1563. Though at the time of her death in 1546 the crowd that came to see her was so large that they had to be forced back to make space for her to burn. In Victorian times, she once again became a household name. Her story has many strands. The evangelical martyr, the Renaissance writer, the woman who refused to admit to the rules of her day, and the innocent victim of vicious Tudor politics. Near Glorious Grimsby lived a knight named William Askew, married to Elizabeth Rothsley. William and Elizabeth were the proud parents of five children, two boys and three girls. In about 1521 they christened their second girl, Anne. There was great excitement when Anne's elder sister, Martha, was betrothed to be married to one Master Kime. But in 1536 disaster struck and Martha died. To Anne's dismay, they offered Anne as a substitute. Anne unwillingly did her duty and she and Master Kaim had two children together. However, all was not well in their household. Anne had been relatively well educated and could certainly read. And so she read and she read the Bible. And what she read there turned her mind to the teaching of the evangelicals. Anne was not of the shy and retiring type, so she shared her views with her neighbors and her husband. Neither were happy with her talk. Lincolnshire were a conservative place and would be in the center of the pilgrimage of grace. When Anne proposed to the glittering cosmopolis that was Lincolnshire to see the Bible there, they made their outrage known to the bishop. Anne later related that, for my friends told me if I did come to Lincoln, the priest would assault me and put me to great trouble. Thereof they have made their boast. Anne was not intimidated one bit and would not be cowed. There in the cathedral she quietly read their Bible. Oh, the act of advancement of religion in 1543 had lain down that women should only read the Bible in private. The cathedral staff frankly ducked the challenge. Only one priest had a go, and Anne later claimed to have been so unimpressed that she didn't even remember what he said. For Master Kaim, Anne's rebellion was too much, and he threw his wife out. Anne responded by demanding a divorce. Anne had no hope of gaining a divorce from the Bishop of Lincoln and she took herself to London to the Court of Chancery where she might have a better chance. She was a well-connected noblewoman and her brother Edward was the cupbearer to the king and her half-brother Christopher had been a gentleman of the Privy Chamber and Edward had served Archbishop Cranmer and critically Anne's sister Jane was married to George St. Paul, a lawyer in the service of the Duke and Duchess of Suffolk, Catherine Willoughby. A member of the Queen's household would have consequences. Anne attracted attention in London and it was probably March 1545 that she first got into trouble. She was hauled in front of the Bishop of London, Edmund Bonner, and interrogated. Eventually Bonner went away and wrote a document, a confession of faith, and demanded she agree to it. Anne's statement through was equivocal. I, Anne, ask you, do believe in all manner of things contained in the faith of Catholic Church. This sounds innocent enough, but Anne has managed to distance herself from the Roman Church and claimed that the proper Catholic Church was of her own, the Reformers. But for now, 
and was released as her family on connection for her cause. In June 1545, Anne Askew was arraigned again before a jury for denying mass. But no witness came forward, so the jury released her. That might have been the end of the matter. However, someone noticed Anne's connection to the Queen's household. The religious conservatives on the King's Council were determined to bring down Queen Catherine Parr, whose evangelical household legitimized support for reform at court. Maybe Anne could be used to incriminate the Queen herself. In May 1546, Thomas Kime and his wife were commanded to attend the King's Council at Greenwich on June 19, 1546. Anne refused to admit that Kime was her husband. And probably much to his relief, he was sent away. For two days, Anne was interrogated by councillors, which included three of the leading religious conservatives. The Chancellor, Thomas Wrightsley, Stephen Gardner, Bishop of Winchester, and William Paget, the King's Principal Secretary. And answered, parried, and on occasion flatly refused to answer the questions. Through her knowledge of the scriptures at the Council's collective head, Gardner tried to charm her. He was her friend. He said he only wanted to save her soul. And firmly and contemptuously pushed this away. These were the kind of weasel words of Judas she spat. The council got nowhere, neither in persuading her that she was in error or in eliciting names. Time and again they pressed her about her connection to the Countess of Hertford, Lady Denny, the Duchess of Suffolk, all women of Catherine Parr's household. Eventually the council gave up. The recorder of the session concluded wearily that, seeing no persuasion of a good reason could take place, she sent to Newgate to remain here to answer to the law. In Newgate prison, Anne started writing of her experience and composing her ballad. But her ordeal had only just started. By the end of June, Anne was arraigned for heresy at Guildhall could have backed down and abjured avoided execution, but she would not. She flatly rejected the existence of any priestly miracle in the Eucharist. As for that ye call your God, it is a piece of bread. For a more proof thereof, let it but lie in the box for three months and it will be moldy. However, Stephen Gardiner Thomas Wrightsley and Richard Rich were no less determined to break Anne. Anne was taken secretly to the tower. Gardner ordered Kingston, the constable of the tower, to have Anne wrecked. Extraordinary, two members of the Privy Council took part of it by hand. Wrightsley and Rich met her there and again pressed her for her connections at court. And in the presence of Anthony Kingston, they threatened her with the rack. This was quite illegal. Torture was not allowed for anyone under the legal process, without express process and without express permission. From the king, noblemen were protected, and it was unthinkable to torture a woman. Still, Anne would not yield. Essentially, Riotsley and Rich ordered Kingston to put Anne to the rack. She was stripped to her shift, then climbed on the rack and was tied. Hands and feet and the wheel turned to tighten the ropes. Anthony Kingston was clearly horrified and once again Anne refused to talk. So Riotsley and Rich demanded she be racked again and much harder. This was too much for Kingston. He refused to be involved any further and, according to some accounts, rushed off to try to get access to the king. And so, the Lord Chancellor of England, Thomas Wrightsley, and the Chancellor of the Court of Augmentations, Richard Rich, both members of the King's Council, 
put aside their robes and put their own hands on the wheel. And they racked her. In Anne's words, then they did put me on the rack because I confess no ladies or gentlemen to be of my opinion. The Lord Chancellor and Master Rich took pain to rack me with their own hands till I was nearly dead. I fainted and then they recovered me again. Still, Anne would not tell them what they wanted to know. She would admit that some men had come to give her some money in prison to help her and that they said that they had come from Lady Denim and Countess Hertford. But that was all. But that wasn't enough for the conservation to build a case. Riley and Rich despaired but could not accept defeat. She then said, after that I sat two long hours with the Lord Chancellor upon the bare floor with many flattering words. He tried to persuade me to leave my opinion. I said I would rather die than break my faith. Ridesley and Rich were beaten. Anne was taken quietly and secretly to a private house to recover from her torture. But the violence seen on her body was too hideous. Her joints were dislocated and she could not walk. Ridesley and Rich had to face the music from the council, horrified by what had been done. But the kind of music we talk about here is a good old tradition establishment cover-up. Not even in that they could succeed and news got out. A London merchant called Arivel Johnson wrote to his brother that Askew remained in a steadfast mind, and yet she hath been racked since her condemnation. In agony in the secret house, Anne once again was given the chance to recant, and once more refused and was sent to Newgate, there to write her story. She would not die alone. Three others John Lascelles, John Hadlam, and John Hemley would also be burned. There was a huge crowd and both Riotsley and Norfolk was there to see it all done. All three men was tied to the stake with faggots around them as normal. But Anne's case was different. She was too broken to walk. Pushing through the crowd and noise came the surgeons, bringing between them a chair which Anne was carried on. She could not stand at the stake to be burned, so a small chair was put at the bottom of the stake and she was tied around the ankles, wrist, chest and neck to the stake where she sat. Then through the crowd came the torturer Thomas Ridesley and he cried out that they still could recant and be pardoned. Anne replied for them all that she came not hither to deny my lord and master. There are alternative views on how merciful Anne's death was. Some account says that a small barrel of gunpowder were used to speed things up. Others wrote that the dyer went particularly slow in punishment for her intransigence, and that it took an hour to kill her. Whatever it was, they all agreed that Anne died with great courage. The plot against Catherine Parr had failed, though Gardner and Ridesley would try a new approach. One more to be prevented by Catherine and her evangelical allies at court. Well. Thank you all for watching this time and remember to subscribe. The next video will be out September 1st and it will be about Margaret Pole. So see you then. Pushing through the crowd and the noise came the surgeons. Pushing through the crowd and the noise came the surgeons.